listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Welcome to this edition of the NeuroFarm Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colby Burns, Dr. Pharmacy. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Chris Tony, Dr. Pharmacy. There's over 4 million podcasts in the United States, but we're certainly glad you're choosing to listen to this one. We hope we can provide you with some educational and entertainment value tonight on this evening. We're recording just after the winter solstice, and this will be our last podcast of the year 2023. Um, any plans for the new year, Chris, or any resolutions coming up? Um, for me, it's just, uh, kind of the similar to a lot of people. I'm going to plan to, uh, try to lose a little weight, exercise more, eat healthier. And yeah, that's about it. If I add anything more than that, it probably won't get much accomplished. <laughs> How about you? You know, pretty similar trying to get more, uh, exercise. I did, uh, run a marathon, um, last year. I completed the Spokane marathon. How was that? It went pretty well. I, I broke four hours, which is mainly like the goal that a lot of marathoners set. Um, it was a pretty tough course too. So apparently nice. that was a good time for that course. You, did you do any preparation for it? I would assume you... I mean, I ran a lot during the summer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would assume you'd have to. Yeah, during the summer months, I, I run a lot. In the winter, I feel like don't get as much running in. It's harder to find the motivation and the weather right. is never as agreeable to running. Um, but yeah, exercise is the best antidepressant. I say that a lot, right. uh, but I believe you it's You get those true. natural endorphins flowing. Yep, and uh, endocannabinoids. I think that running uh, activates the endocannabinoid system is why you get the runner's high. It's not uh, wow. not dopamine, which was originally thought. It actually is endocannabinoids. But interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a topic, I suppose, for another time. Um, weight loss, yes. though. Yeah, weight loss is an interesting one to bring up because on November eighth, the FDA approved the drug Zetbound, which is a combined glucagon like one peptide and glucose independent. Sorry, glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide. Um. This initially is marketed as Manjaro to treat type 2 diabetes. Uh, when I was working in retail pharmacy briefly, when Manjaro came out, Eli Lilly came out with a discount card so patients could get Manjaro basically for $25. The manufacturer was covering the rest of the cost of the drug. Um, and then it seemed like they realized they were spending too much on this program. The drug was very successful, so they prohibited it to only patients with a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes to exclude people getting it for weight loss or pre-diabetes. Um, but that was when it was not approved for weight loss. Now it is approved for weight loss. It's unique in the fact that its dosing for obesity is basically the same as its dosing for diabetes. Um, a lot of these other GLP-1 drugs have a different dosing for weight loss than they do for diabetes. But Zetbound has uh, the same dosing scale. It's 2.5 milligram once a week for four weeks, then increase into five milligram once a week, up to a maximum of 15 milligram once a week. I watched an episode recently of Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO, uh, featured NYU marketing professor and entrepreneur Scott Galloway, who stated that he thought that GLP-1 drugs for weight loss could not just be the biggest breakthrough in medicine, we have seen in decades, but also the biggest breakthrough for society in general, um, even bigger than generative AI or chat GPT, he thought. And I also heard this on a recent podcast called Plain English by um, Atlantic writer Derek Thompson. He also mentioned that GLP-1s could be the biggest uh, thing for our society if they're brought on board in large numbers. So I want to discuss the evidence and break down the height versus facts. Uh, in the Surmount 4 trial recently completed, patients with a BMI over 30 or a BMI over 27 with at least one weight-related comorbidity 
We're starting on a 36 week open label phase at either 10 milligram or 15 milligram of ZEP bound. And they achieved a mean weight reduction of 20.9% from baseline. Uh, that was in combination with an exercise regimen and calorie restricted diet. And those who continued on ZEP bound for 52 weeks during the extended open label phase lost an additional 6.7% of weight from baseline, which equates to overall over 26% reduction of weight, which is pretty remarkable. There's also been surprising secondary findings from the use of GLP-1 agonists for weight loss. Uh, an article on GLP-1s is put out by Morgan Stanley, which is a business journal, of course, not a medical journal. Uh, but they're warning on the business side about the potential for GLP-1s to disrupt the entire food industry. As Ancedilla research shows, 60% of users surveyed reported reducing candy and alcohol consumption while on GLP-1s, while 40% increased consumption of fruits and vegetables, and 36% increased exercise. Uh, these drugs once were thought to work by increasing satiety or feelings of fullness by reducing gastric emptying, but now it seems they might work by some unknown mechanism. Um, maybe it's similar to how Viagra was initially developed for pulmonary hypertension, but then was shown actually to treat erectile dysfunction and marketed for a different purpose. Some also say scientists may have accidentally discovered an anti-addiction drug uh, because these drugs seem to reduce cravings for both food and alcohol. So that's why it might be interesting from a mental health standpoint. It's also going to be a big business by all estimates, potentially a $350 billion industry within the next 10 years. It came out this week, though, that a large number of users who stop using GLP-1s for weight end up regaining the weight after a couple months. So maybe that's not good from a pharmacy standpoint, but it's good from a drug company standpoint. It does seem like a big trend in healthcare, though, so it might be one we'll cover in the future about GLP-1 agonists for weight loss and for addiction, um, that there's some research around that. You know, we know that type 2 diabetes is, is very closely related to obesity, and so um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, I'm not surprised that, you know, they found a medication you know, that treats diabetes, it also helps treat the obesity. Because I've seen studies that show that if, if patients lose enough weight, they can actually uh, get rid of the type 2 diabetes altogether. So I think they're very directly related. Yeah, they're directly, very directly related. And, uh, you know, weight is a risk factor for a lot of other conditions too. Yeah, I think it, I think it has a uh, a lot of potential so we'll see but um you know exercise is still going to be an important factor i think because uh, we don't want to just uh rely on a drug to help us lose weight um, i think there's a lot of benefits to exercising too that go beyond just weight loss as we kind of discussed in the beginning yeah for mood too i think a big thing for mood is exercise how important that is uh, if you saw the article on seasonal effectiveness disorder talked about that about that being good treatment for SAD. Mm -hmm. Another uh, big news story this week was on Tuesday, the uh, MAPS PBC submitted a new drug application to the FDA for MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. The FDA is expected to review the application and make a decision by the end of the year. Um, there's a major breakthrough as MDMA could become the first ever psychedelic drug to be approved. You know, potential to save thousands of lives that are lost due to suicide from treatment-resistant PTSD every year. As of course, there are very few alternative treatments that have been shown to be equally as effective. Um, and we'll see how agencies will roll out their own protocols during the year, and if there'll be more training for facilitators. The Department of Defense actually approved funding for. Um, clinical research on MDMA for active duty service members as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. So that will be interesting as well to see how that's rolled out. But now we are going to talk, as promised, about Ibogaine. Uh, it's one of the psychedelic treatments we really haven't covered so far. So Chris, what can you tell us about Ibogaine? Yeah, so let's jump into the history and pharmacology of Ibogaine. So Ibogaine is the major constituent and the root of tabernanth iboga, which is a shrub 
commonly found in West and Central Africa. Uh, iboga has been used for centuries by indigenous cultures for both medicinal and ceremonial purposes. The first published account of the religious use of iboga was in Gabon, uh, published in French journals in 1885, and it was first synthesized in a lab in 1901. It was sold in France as a muscle relaxer under the name Lambi or Lambarine from 1939 to 1966. Uh, Lambi was sold in 200 milligram tablets, which contained about five milligrams of actual iboga alkaloids with labeling to take two to four tablets a day. Uh, France outlawed the sale in 1966 and the US FDA similarly placed it under schedule one classification, uh, meaning it has no medical value um, and the International Olympic Committee also outlawed it as a potential uh, doping agent. It was believed to be a substance likely to cause dependency or endanger human health and is still banned in most countries, although possession is legal in Australia, New Zealand, Finland, and Uruguay. Interest in its use has really been reinvigorated during the opioid crisis due to its potential to treat addiction and Kentucky in particular has developed an Ibogaine initiative to allocate its $42 million in the state received from opioid settlements towards clinical research for Ibogaine uh, for treating drug addiction. Former NBA player and ex-Kardashian spouse Lamar Adam spoke at an event in Louisville uh, promoting the initiative. Yeah. Um Lamar Odom, you know, talked about it, but beyond uh, his testimony, there are many military veterans who have also gone on the record to talk about their experiences at Ibogaine, going outside the United States for access to Ibogaine therapy performed by shamans and foreign clinics. Uh, veterans have talked about its use not just for substance abuse, but also for PTSD, trauma, depression, anxiety, and for cognitive impairment. So a study of Special Operation Forces veterans um, was published in the Journal of Chronic Stress. It surveyed 51 veterans aged 18 to 64 years old, 96% um, who were non-Hispanic white men and average age of 40 years old. They received assisted therapy with both Ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT um, in a psychedelic service center in Mexico from 2017 to 2019. 60% of the participants were deployed five or more times, and 82% reported sustaining significant head injuries, uh, generally somewhere between one and 10 head injuries. 63% were Navy SEALs, and nearly 100% were veterans of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Individuals are referred by word of mouth and completed screening with physician, with which particularly check for drug interactions and they complete a tapering protocol as directed by a pharmacist for any interacting medications that would pose problems for the use of Ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT. All individuals also had to complete a metabolic panel, a urine drug screen, a 12-lead EKG, and patients obese um, and over 55 were required to undergo a stress test prior to starting the trial. So the clinical protocol took place over three days. On day one, patients identified their intentions for the experience, were administered a final urine tox screen, and then received a single dose of Ibogaine of 10 milligram per kilogram. Patients received continuous cardiac monitoring and IV fluids during their session. And then day two was spent processing and integrating their Ibogaine experience. And day three involved preparation for DMT and the actual DMT session. Patients received at least three doses of 5 milligram, 15 milligram, or 30 milligram of DMT uh, for a total of 50 milligram, and DMT was inhaled in this scenario. Patients that did not obtain the desired effect were given a fourth dose of 30 milligram and possibly a fifth dose of 45 milligram. Patients then completed post-session integration, both individually and in a group. The primary outcome was to assess for changes in mental health domains, including suicidal ideation, cognitive functioning, and symptoms of PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Statistically significant improvements were noted in all domains, and in most cases, the differences observed were very large. 
with a substantial number of participants no longer meeting clinical cutoffs for diagnosis of PTSD after completing therapy. Reports also showed a large increase in psychological flexibility from before to after completion of psychedelic treatment, which is strongly correlated with reductions of cognitive impairment, PTSD, and depression and anxiety. Over 80% reported they were very satisfied with the treatment program. 92% stated they were very likely to recommend the treatment to others. And 96% reported that the treatment was much better than programs they had tried in the past. A vast majority also reported that completion of the program was one of the most meaningful experiences of their entire lives on both a spiritual and emotional level, with participants reporting strong changes in their personal sense of life satisfaction, life purpose and meaning, attitudes about life and death, and relationship to nature and with other people in their lives. This is consistent with other research around psychedelic-assisted therapy, uh, reflecting the fact there's some kind of ineffable component to therapy that demonstrates benefits beyond what can simply be measured by scientific factors. Uh, now, the study was obviously limited by selection bias and was conducted in a narrow sample of patients, although I would probably argue that special operations combat veterans are a proportion of the population that's generally underrepresented in most clinical research, um, at least in the civilian life. And the study did not use a placebo control um, or adjust for expectancy effects. And of course, in my opinion, it also would have been beneficial to have gathered more data on what treatments participants had tried in the past before going to this trial, because I didn't really see that reported. And it would have perhaps further proved the benefit of psychedelic therapy and results could have been stratified by prior treatment, perhaps, to see if treatment effects were greater in those who had failed more therapies or specific therapies so we can better determine who's most likely to benefit from Ibogaine. Um, but the results are so dramatic, I, I feel they can't be ignored, particularly considering the status quo of treatment for this population. You know, we look at the data on outcomes in veterans with PTSD. Um, we've stated some of these numbers before, but uh, PTSD is considered treatment resistant up to 50% of cases using standard methods of treatment, including cognitive behavioral therapy and SSRIs. And in those with PTSD, the risk of suicide increases dramatically. Somewhere between 25% and 33% of those with PTSD have attempted suicide. And the overall suicide rate for those with PTSD is over twice that of the general population. Um, and may even be three to four times higher for women with PTSD compared to the average veteran. So it would also be nice to see more female veterans represented in some of these psychedelic studies. There also seems to be a strong link between traumatic brain injury or TBI and PTSD, especially among military veterans. But TBI itself may be an independent risk factor for suicide, as even among those with mild TBI symptoms, the risk of suicide is increased by two times compared to the standard population. Uh, so it's very important we to continue to develop new treatment options for this population. And that's, I think, why so many veterans are willing to even skirt you know, federal laws to go outside the U.S. to obtain Ibogaine, um, as well as MDMA and other therapies that can help solve the problems they're facing that most treatments in America don't seem to be able to be helping for. But moving on from talking about the data uh, in this study, how does Ibogaine work in the body? Uh, so Ibogaine has a complex pharmacology. Um, it's considered a tryptamine similar to DMT and psilocybin, uh, but its structure is more complicated than those two molecules as it has multiple side chains, giving it two chiral centers and four different stereoisomer configurations. Um, Ibogaine has an active metabolite called noribogaine, uh, which is actually more potent than its parent molecule. Um, Ibogaine has a half-life of around six hours, uh, but noribogaine has a half-life of around 18 hours uh, because Ibogaine is deposited in fat cells and slowly metabolized into noribogaine as it gets released. Noribogaine levels show higher plasma levels than Ibogaine in the body and is generally considered uh, more potent than Ibogaine. The time to max concentration is about two hours for Ibogaine versus three and a half hours for Noribogaine. 
ibogaine and noribogaine affect multiple neurotransmitters at the same time, uh, stimulating the 5-HT2 receptors like psilocybin and DMT, uh, specifically the 5-HT2A receptor and 5-HT2C receptors, um, and the sigma-2 receptor, all of which likely contributes to a hallucinogenic effect. Uh, they also have, both have affinity to the uh, glutamate NMDA receptor, uh, similar to ketamine. Uh, Noribogaine is a potent serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which could be responsible for its long-term effects on mood but also cause a risk of drug interactions, which we will get into later. Uh, both ibogaine and noribogaine act as antagonists at nicotine receptors, similar to the FDA-approved smoking cessation drug Wellbutrin or Zyban, which is the generic name for bupropion. Both ibogaine and noribogaine act as antagonists at nicotine receptors, similar to the FDA-approved smoking cessation drug Wellbutrin or Zyban, which both have the generic name of bupropion, although noribogaine has a greater effect at these receptors than ibogaine does. Both drugs also target opioid receptors, but again, noribogaine has a greater effect than ibogaine itself, serving as a weak mu opioid receptor agonist and a moderate kappa receptor agonist, uh, which gives it some similarities to methadone as it binds with a greater selectivity to these receptors than traditional opioids like morphine. And it also shares some similarities to uh, salvinorin A or salvia, particularly the ability of both substances to cause a temporary dysphoria, which is also a sense of uh, mental un uneasiness yeah we haven't talked about salvia yet i guess that's one other um kind of psychedelic right. substance we haven't covered yeah um, we probably should but sort of that so sort of that dysphoria is temporary but i think it's why a lot of people say ibogaine is not experienced they want to necessarily try again um you know it seems to have a very meaningful outcomes people experience but the actual trip you know is challenging and difficult so yeah but a lot of people um will say sometimes even the the unpleasant trips can teach them something about themselves or about life and sometimes that can be beneficial yeah for sure um you know generations have used these substances for that reason to gain greater insights uh Mm -hmm. You know, and we need it now in our society where there's a lot of uh, people struggling to find a meaning or purpose. Right. But anyways, exactly. um, based on Ibogaine's mechanism of action and its potential similarities to other FDA approved therapies for smoking cessation and opioid use disorder and the urgent need for more therapies uh, treating opioid use disorder, which is taking the lives of over 100,000 people every year in the United States. Uh, Ibogaine is drawing strong interests uh, for the treatment of opioid use disorders, we kind of mentioned at the beginning. Anecdotal reports on the benefits of Ibogaine in treating opioid use disorder date back to the 1960s, when 19-year-old Howard Lotsoff noticed subjective improvements in heroin withdrawal symptoms of himself and his five friends after consuming Ibogaine. Uh, I, I don't know where he got the Ibogaine. I keep trying to find the answer to that, but Somehow he was a chronic drug user, also a very smart guy who got Ibogaine and then noticed it helped with his withdrawals. So eventually he contracted with a Belgian company to produce Ibogaine in tablet form for clinical trials in the Netherlands. And he was awarded a U.S. patent for the use of Ibogaine for opioid use disorder in 1985. The first studies showing the potential of Ibogaine to attenuate or weaken the effects of opioid withdrawal in rats was published in 1988. Further preclinical studies in rats show reduced self-administration of morphine in a 1991 trial, a reduced self-administration of cocaine in 1993, and reduced administration of alcohol in 1995. The use of Ibogaine began to spread in the late 1980s and early 1990s, with Ibogaine clinics opening in Panama, the UK, the Netherlands, and in Mexico, 
In the U.S., the National Institute for Drug Abuse began funding preliminary clinical research on the toxicology of Ibogaine in the 1990s in preparation for future use in humans. However, the National Institute of Health cut funding for further research in 1995, citing concerns about cere cerebellar toxicity. As studies in rats showed that at doses of around 100 mg per kilogram, Ibogaine led to the degeneration of Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. Uh, if you don't know, the cerebellum is the center of movement and balance within the brain and has been described kind of as the second brain or little brain in the body. So it's a very important structure. Uh, but after the decision by the NIH to cut funding for Ibogaine research, progress slowed down on research for sure. An FDA-sponsored phase one clinical trial on Ibogaine for cocaine dependency, which had been previously approved to be conducted at the University of Miami in 1993, was then canceled after this national funding was lost. However, the study um, kind of went rogue and ended up being completed after all on the island of St. Kitts, with results being published in 2018. So this is an open label study enrolling 277 patients. 191 were included in the intention to treat population. The study enrolled 144 male patients and 47 female patients, all meeting DSM-4 criteria for nicotine or opioid dependency. The participants were stratified into two groups by either being opioid or cocaine dependent. The average age of the patients in the opioid treatment group was 36 years old, and the average patient had five prior inpatient admissions for opioid dependency, with an average of 11 years of prior substance use. 95% of the patients were Caucasian, 67% were male, and 52% met clinical criteria for major depressive disorder. In the cocaine treatment group, the average patient age was also 36 years old, with 13 years of lifetime use of baseline and five prior inpatient admissions. 78% were Caucasian and 85% were male, and 40% had a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Patients were screened at baseline and were excluded if they had a history of HIV or AIDS, epilepsy, stroke, psychotic disorders, including bipolar 1 disorder, or cardiovascular or liver pathology. Patients were given Ibogaine gel caps at doses of 8 to 12 milligram per kilogram, with the dosing range overall of around 500 to 1,000 milligram. And they were monitored for adverse events by a clinician, including being on EKG monitoring for 24 hours after consumption. Craving was subjectively measured by patients using the um, heroin craving questionnaire 29 or the cocaine craving questionnaire 45. And mood was assessed using the Beck Depression Inventory Scale. The results of the trial showed Ibogaine was well tolerated with nausea and vomiting and ataxia of gait. Um, again, that could be due to the effects on the cerebellum being the most common side effects, which typically resolved within 12 hours. No changes were noted on physical examination of safety laboratory tests across the entire dosing range. Perceptual changes were commonly noted and headaches were observed in 7% of the population, uh, more common in the opioid dependent group than the cocaine group. And 5% noted orthostatic hypotension and brad bradycardia, uh, which is more common in the cocaine treatment group. As a result, they added an IV fluid bolus to the protocol to be given one hour prior to treatment. So that really helped with the um, bradycardia and orthotech hypertension, which you know, could be based on fluid shifts and low fluid volume causing uh, low blood pressure. Patients in the opioid dependency group had significant reductions in all five domains of opioid craving as measured by the heroin craving questionnaire, HCG, uh, HCQ, sorry, 29. Signs of opioid withdrawal were also significantly reduced in the first 36 hours after use of Ibogaine. And the cocaine use disorder group, significant reductions in craving were observed in both the CCQ29 and in the Minnesota Cocaine Craving Scale across the domains of frequency, intensity, and duration of cravings. All these measurements were taken at one month after discharge, and significant reductions were seen across all subscales. A significant reduction of depression symptoms was also observed in both treatment groups as measured by the Beck Depression Inventory. So users were also asked to evaluate their experiences while on Ibogaine therapy. 
Um, users reported a period of active visualizations beginning 30 to 45 minutes after ingestion and a dreamlike state lasting between four and eight hours, which some described as akin to feeling like they were watching a movie before a period of more quiet self-introspection. Visual distortions were noted in 62% of subjects, with 58% noting a divine presence or feeling as if they are connected to a higher power, and 50% felt as if they were cleansed or reborn after treatment. Most importantly, only 16% said they would try Ibogaine again, indicating a low potential for abuse. Overall, this trial decreased cravings for alcohol in a statistically significant percentage of the trial population. Uh, most patients in this study had experienced many prior treatment failures, and this was kind of their last hope for recovery from addiction. So uh, this is a very desperate group, and they were able to find, the majority of them find benefit from Ibogaine therapy. Uh, what about the safety of Ibogaine, might be asking. There is a dark side of Ibogaine therapy in that there have been 33 reported deaths from Ibogaine uh, between 1990 and 2020. Most of these patients died from acute heart failure or cardiac arrest. Uh, it's probably safe to say that around 100% of these deaths occurred in settings without strict medical supervision. Uh, it's also possible that you know this number is underreported because we don't really know how many people have tried Ibogaine. Um, at the MAPS conference that was recently held in Denver, you know, about psychedelics, estimated that 10,000 people have received Ibogaine therapy, but mostly in underground settings. So again, that's really kind of just a ballpark figure. From a toxicology standpoint, Ibogaine and nor Ibogaine interact with the HERG or H-E-R-G or calcium channels in the heart. I'm not going to try to explain the acronym HERG, but there are calcium channels in the heart. Um, interacting with these channels can cause QT prolongation, which puts users at a risk for cardiac arrhythmias and cardiac arrests. Methadone and buprenorphine, which are of course, prescription meds frequently used for opioid use disorder also interfere with the HERG channel at a similar potency, so that side effect isn't necessarily unique to Ibogaine. And most known cases of Ibogaine fatalities have occurred with cumulative doses of greater than 20 milligram per kilogram, which was well above the amount used in the study at St. Kitts, where 12 milligram per kilogram was a max dose. And patients in the St. Kitts study were also excluded if they had a baseline heart rate of less than 50 beats per minute, or if they had baseline long QT syndrome. Yeah, so the study in St. Kitts uh, also involved pharmacokinetic monitoring. Um, and one important finding noted that was that uh, they noted uh, is that um, in other research, Ibogaine is converted to noribogaine nearly 100% by uh, the enzyme CYP2D6. Uh, and CYP2D6 is responsible for up to 25% uh, of uh, metabolism of all drugs, um, including a majority of antidepressants. Uh, some drugs like paroxetine or Paxil are inhibitors of the CYP2D6 enzyme. Uh, so taking it and other strong inhibitors with Ibogaine can substantially increase uh, the risk of toxicity. It's best to taper off under medical supervision or pharmacist supervision uh, before trying Ibogaine. You know, Colby mentioned uh, methadone and buprenorphine, uh, you know, those both prolong QT. Uh, so, you know, adding Ibogaine um, in addition to those drugs, uh, if somebody's on those medications, which are used for opioid withdrawal, can uh, prolong QT. And then if you add Ibogaine to that, you're potentially prolonging QD, the QT prolongation uh, issue even further. But another factor um, to consider is that some people carry genetic traits uh, that make them uh, slow CYP2D6 metabolizers. Um, it's estimated that around 5% of the population are poor uh, CYP2D6 metabolizers, although it tends to vary by ethnic background. Uh, about 10% of Caucasians are poor metabolizers compared to uh, 20% of those of African descendancy and about 1% of those with Asian descendancy. Uh, there are testing panels that are available that can check for a person's CYP2D6 metabolic genotype. 
um, and it may be beneficial to screen for these uh, pharmacogenomic variations before a patient uh, starts ibogaine treatment. Um, and I've heard of some, some clinics who do make uh, testing a standard of practice. Uh, neuroplasticity is a buzzword that pops up a lot around psychedelics, and it's a new science that it seems is still being understood. Uh, it's not exactly clear how ibogaine and noribogaine act on the glial-derived, sorry, neurotrophic factor pathway, or GDNF, uh, which is involved in the dopamine or reward pathway, uh, which is key to the reinforcing of drug addiction. Uh, and this could be why it's so effective. Uh, there's a lot of research now being done on Ibogaine after it had been ignored for so many years since Howard Lotsoff's early experiments. Uh, small studies in Brazil and Spain are ongoing to test Ibogaine for treatment of opioid and alcohol addiction, and observational data continues to be gathered in New Zealand where Ibogaine is legal by prescription and results have continued to show promise for ibogaine therapy in reducing or eliminating symptoms of drug addiction and withdrawal. And some companies are now developing synthetic ibogaine alternatives. Uh, MindMed is sponsoring a phase one trial in Australia of a synthetic ibogaine derivative uh, currently called MC18 with its CEO saying, quote, we do see merit in hallucinogenic drugs uh, we just don't see the merit of Ibogaine because I don't think anyone wants to take medicine and have the risk of having a heart attack, uh, end quote. So far, uh, safety data showed no adverse uh, cardiovascular effects of the drug. Scientists at UC Davis recently engineered a compound called uh, tabernanthalog, or TBG, uh, which was tested in mice and found to be non-hallucinogenic while also exhibiting antidepressant effects and reduced heroin and alcohol-seeking behavior. Demerix is an American company founded in 2010 by Dr. Deborah Mash, a prominent neuroscientist and drug addiction researcher who has been involved in the field of Ibogaine research since the early 90s and was among the primary investigators in the St. Kitts study. Uh, her company, based in Florida, is advancing Ibogaine research for opioid use disorder. Uh, they are currently working on the DMX IB201A trial, which is a dose finding the pharmacokinetic phase one study in the UK where uh, participants will receive three, six, and nine milligram per kilogram doses. There is currently no research being conducted on Ibogaine with human subjects in the U.S. or Canada, but as we mentioned at the opening of this podcast, uh, the Kentucky Initiative could soon change that. Yeah, it seems, you know, from the literature, the Ibogaine does carry some risks, and that shouldn't be downplayed. Um, but as we talked about, kind of the same theme we talked about in our Kratom podcast, Opioid overdoses are killing over 100,000 Americans every year. From May 2022 to May 2023, over that 12-month period, a rate of 307 Americans died every day from an opioid overdose. Uh, the numbers are really skyrocketing. Uh, 70,000 people died in a year in 2019. So, you know, we're continuing to see numbers climb and climb and climb every year. Uh, right now, and there needs to be better treatment options developed quickly to help save lives. Um, Suboxone and methadone, you know, on their own are kind of the two main options, but it just doesn't seem that's enough. And, you know, I have talked to people who've recovered from drug addiction, and one of the things that bothers them about Suboxone in particular is they don't want to just have to take another pill for the rest of their lives. If they get clean from opioids, they want to be done with taking daily medication and not feel like they're taking uh, or sorry, trading one form of dependency for another. And that's, I think the real benefit from psychedelics like Ibogaine, that it may be possible to provide relief from addiction for up to six months with just a single dose, uh, just a single experience. And I think it's a similar story for those with PTSD or major depression. 
and that you know people don't want to take these cocktails of uppers and downers prescribed to them that they will generally have to take for the rest of their lives. They really want to be free from pharmacotherapy um, and be able to go on to live a life of more meaning and purpose. So I think that these experiences, you know, that's why there's a lot of hype around them and excitement because they could be effective in promoting that lifestyle. We just want to make sure they can be safely. As these synthetic derivatives are really interesting, uh, especially ones that aren't cardiotoxic, like the one from MindMed. Uh, but unfortunately, they're probably still years away from being finalized. So began itself, you know, probably deserves more research and funding because we can more quickly get it out there versus other products, which are starting at, you know, square one of development and have to go through a lot more testing at this point. What are your thoughts on that, Chris? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, um, current, tr I mean, the biggest culprit, I think, right now on the streets that is killing people with the opioid epidemic is is not really prescriptions. It's it's fentanyl, and it's so powerful that um, you know a lot of people are dying um, not because uh, you know they're they're accidentally dying because it, the dose is so small that you know they can't really tell if they're if they're taking a fatal dose or not. I also totally agree that um, you know. People want to be free from drugs and uh, kind of live a healthy lifestyle without drugs. And if, if psychedelics, psychedelics seem to be, to be able to show that uh, that that is a possibility. Uh, current treatment is to put somebody on methadone or buprenorphine, uh, you know, for the rest of their lives, basically. And it's basically feeding into that idea that you know you're just a slave to the drug that you you're addicted to, you know, uh, buprenorphine and methadone or opioids, uh, just like fentanyl and heroin. So, um, I don't think it really helps the mental state of the patient, uh, to be put on those, um, what they call medication assisted therapy treatments because they're just, you know, continuing to live that lifestyle of being dependent on a drug. And so if you can break that cycle, and uh, have a new way of, of living life without drugs, then it's all the better, not only physically, but mentally. And um, as long as Ibogaine can be studied and they can find ways to use it in a way to where it's uh, less harmful, I think it definitely has its place in therapy and, and treating these different uh, disorders. So hopefully uh, Kentucky will get rolling here on their study and uh, we'll find that we can use it here in the United States in a safe way and it'll help thousands of people. Yep, we will, we will certainly see. Um, you know, right now a lot of people are going outside the United States to get it. So, you know, if they could get it in the U.S., I'm sure that would be easier for our veterans and other people that want to access it. Um, that's all we have for now. And don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment, question if you have one. Anyways, thanks for listening. This podcast is presented for educational and informational purposes only. As licensed pharmacists, we do not advocate for the self-administration of products designed to be given only under medical supervision, nor do we recommend for or against the use of products listed as Schedule 1 under Drug Enforcement Administration guidance nor do you recommend using prescription-only products that have not been prescribed to you by a licensed prescriber. We assume no responsibility for any legal repercussions that may occur to the individual after the use of federally illicit substances. Thank you for listening and for your continued support of the Neural Farm podcast. Did you know we have a newsletter and blog? Go to neuralfarm.substack.com to subscribe to the newsletter and blog. You'll find a variety of topics around the field of alternative mental health including one I mentioned about seasonal effectiveness disorder recently, as well as many other topics. The newsletter covers trending topics in psychedelic science research, regulation, and policy. That, again, is neuralfarm.substack.com. Go there now, like, and subscribe, and keep up the latest updates.